I want to start off this lecture by reminding you that there's a quiz due on July 16th um, at 11.59 p.m. It'll be open at 12 a.m. on the 16th and you have 24 hours to complete it. Um, if you have any questions or are unable to complete within that time, please let me know beforehand um, as soon as possible and we'll see if we can make accommodations for you. But it'll be open at 12 a.m. on July 16th and it'll be closed at 11.59 p.m. So you have a 24 hour window to get it done. So we're on Unit 5, which is Descriptive and Correlational Research, um, a very important topic today. So our objectives today are to talk specifically about descriptive and correlational research, which we'll go dive into more detail later, and understand different correlational research techniques. So uh, the descriptive research will be pretty short, um, but correlational research will dive pretty deep into as to what that is and how we can um, talk about different techniques associated with that. Now, throughout this entire subject, in fact, even next unit, I want us to kind of remember internal and external validity. Remember, internal validity is associated with your study design and how you can use your studies that design to actually make an inference about your outcome of interest. And external validity is associated with um, how you can generalize your study to another population or to your population of interest. Um, this is an important aspect here in this um, uh, class and throughout your entire uh, career here at CSU and as a psychological researcher or in psychology in general in any course that you take you will be learning about internal and external validity again this is not the first time that this will come up so there's four different research types that um, we'll be discussing throughout this course um, so there's descriptive and correlational quasi-experimental and experimental research now we're only going to be talking about uh, two of these today and then for next week we'll be talking about the quasi-experimental and experimental research but today we're just going to talk about descriptive and correlational research so descriptive research is a study that includes only one variable and that variable is measured right so remember the difference between manipulated and measured variables this is where only one measured variable is looked at and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming slides Next, we're going to talk about correlational research. This is a study that includes two or more variables in which all variables are measured. Remember how we, again, we talked about the difference between manipulated variables and measured variables? In correlational research, everything is measured. You're not manipulating any aspect of your study. And that's an essential point that we're going to be talking about with this correlational research and how we can actually study things and make observations and inferences based on correlational research. And what kind of inferences can we say because of this? So let's go ahead and first start off with descriptive research. Descriptive research is information of a population simply collected via observations or some sort of survey. You only have one variable that you're looking at. So take, for example, this um, histogram to the left here where we're looking at vehicle crashes um, and the frequency that they happen um, in the flow of vehicles. So it's trying to really take a snapshot of what you're seeing right now. So simply trying to find what exists right now with one variable. They're usually these summary statistics. Um, you can only obtain univariate descriptive statistics and univariate is where you compile things into kind of one number. So a mean, a median, a mode, a standard deviation. Um, in which case we'll talk about which uh, your book goes into pretty good detail about the differences between mean median mode and standard deviation so if you want to talk about if you want to learn more about those then i would encourage you to read your uh book but really descriptive research we're not going to dive too deep into what this is but know that this is um essentially when you're just describing one variable so you're just describing the proportion of males in a population you are just describing the um uh the number of vehicle accidents right so it's just something with one variable only so 
I, the reason I don't want to talk about it too much is because really descriptive research is not the most exciting subject in the world, um, but it's pretty important, right? Um, I find at any job, there's some sort of descriptive research happening. Anytime you do research, you need to know the mean, the median, the mode. You need to know standard deviation. You can talk about how skewed a variable is. You know, there's a lot more that we can talk about. So that's really why... Um, we need to talk about descriptive research in general, but there's not tons to talk about with it, honestly, so that's why I'm not going to dive in too deep, but just know that it's an important aspect of any research study that you do, um, and it'll come up again, and you'll be um, using descriptive research in your own um, field of study. Now we're going to talk about correlational research, and this is really where the thesis of this entire lecture is going to be about and how we can talk about correlational research. So, what is correlational research? So in correlational research, we're measuring variables and testing the associations between them. Now I want us to know we're not manipulating any variable. We're simply observing or measuring a variable. You can measure two or more variables, but as soon as you start manipulating things, then you're into experimental research, which is not what we're talking about right now. Um, so you can measure two or more variables. Uh, there's different statistical analyses that are used for each of them. So for example, and we'll kind of dig into what these are. There's correlation, there's regression. There's all sorts of different types of statistical techniques that you can associate with these. Um, when we're talking about correlational research, remember I'm a stickler with this. When, since we're not manipulating any variables, our main variable of interest is uh, going to be our predictor variable, which is going to predict the outcome variable. We're not going to be using the terms independent variable and dependent variable at all. Right? So when we're talking about correlational research, when we're just talking about measuring variables and not manipulating anything, we use predictor and outcome to talk about our uh, variables of interest. So predictor is predicting our outcome variable. And I honestly prefer the terms predictor and outcome. It's a lot more clear to me as to which one comes before the other, whereas independent variable and dependent variable, you're not, you kind of get them mixed up every now and then. So I really like the terms predictor and outcome anyways, um, whenever I'm talking about any research design. There's a few different types of correlational types of research, and we'll discuss these in more detail. The first one is natural observations, then survey research, which is very highly used in uh, psychological research, which I mostly use, and then there's archival research, which is probably one that you haven't quite heard of, but are a little bit more familiar with than you think. So, Starting off with natural observation, right? We can see from, it's probably pretty obvious what it is, but this is where you're observing and recording variables in the natural environment without interfering in any way. Um, so you're not controlling the environment in any way. I mean, I think this picture really gives a good detail. I mean, you, this person is obviously recording something in the forest or something. She might be recording chimpanzees. It doesn't necessarily have to be humans all the time either. In psychological research, we're mostly interested in humans, but you never know um, what it is. But essentially, you're just taking notes. You are um, counting the number of times somebody touches their face. You're counting the number of times someone smiles. Um, now, the problem with this is that you're at risk for subjective interpretations um, from this. So really, what I observe is different than what you observe or someone else observes, right? But remember from a couple of units ago, we talked about inter-rater reliability and how we can combat that, right? So we can use inter-rater reliability. So this is using multiple observers to observe the same thing and seeing how much agreement is among them to determine whether or not um, our inferences are a little bit more valid and giving us more confidence in our observations that we made. So one of the aspects associated with behavioral research is developing behavioral codes. So you create these coding schemes that are derived from research questions or theory of some sort. So when you're developing some sort of coding scheme, your questions need to be defined, uh, I'm sorry, refined and clarified. You need to name dimensions of interest. So let's say, for example, I'm interested in smiling. I need to define what a smile is, like how much is, is do I need to show teeth for it to be a real smile? Like, is this a smile versus is, is that a smile? Um, you know, how much of a smile is that interested? Um, 
you know, and then um, what constitutes some sort of aspect that you're interested in. Um, you know, like, for example, if I was interested in seeing how many people rolled a stop sign, right, who went through a stop sign without stopping, well, what constitutes rolling a stop sign, right? Did they have to make a complete stop for it to cop, or are we going to let them go? If they went over the line a little bit, does that constitute rolling a stop sign? There's a lot of different aspects that you need to think about when you're developing these behavioral codes. Additionally, you need to then identify categories that characterize each dimension. So um, thinking about this in terms of each of these dimensions, so rolling a stop sign, like you can identify different categories, like side, sort of rolled a stop sign, completely blew through the stop sign, completely um, made a complete stop at the stop sign. Um, is what you'll do. And then you always want to pilot test. And when I say pilot test, that means, I'm not sure if this is a term that you're familiar with, but pilot test means pre-test. You want to try and go out, do a small scale study based on your behavioral coding schemes that you've already created, hopefully, um, and seeing how well they work. And then you come back in from that small scale study and say what worked, what didn't work, um, and understanding what that's all about. I want to go ahead and relate this back to um, reliability in our observer agreement. So a really strong behavioral um, observation uses standardized coding techniques. And to the right here, you kind of see um, what a kind of uh, standardized coding technique looks at here. So this is an instance where we, ha we have individuals look at uh, people uh, same-sex dyads, uh, so it's two people of the same sex, and seeing how much when they talk to each other, how much do they smile, how much do they joke, how much do they laugh, and you have two minutes that you're able to look at it. So there's person A and there's person B, and you're essentially tallying how much they do each of the things in the um, indicator variable. This isn't exactly the best indication of it, but it shows kind of how this works in general, right? Now the agreement part is extremely um, important for this. So you have multiple people rating the same group of people to see how much they smile, joke, laugh for uh, one to three minutes. And the higher that the people agree, so if there was, um, let's say there were five tally marks, um, associated in the smile, well, let's hope that my other person also has five tally marks where they saw the individual smile five times within the first minute. The more agreement that we have, the more accuracy that we can talk about. And again, we can calculate that Cohen's kappa, which we talked about um, in a previous unit as well when we we're talking about reliability. The higher Cohen's kappa, remember that goes on a scale from zero to one, with one indicating more agreement among the raters. So we can have higher inter-rater reliability if we calculate that Cohen's kappa, keeping in mind that Cohen's kappa only works with two raters. I forgot to mention in the previous slides that we're going to have an entire unit dedicated to observational research later. So if you feel like you weren't fulfilled with the observational research aspect of this, uh, don't worry, we're going to talk a lot more about it in later units. I wanted to talk about it in this unit because it's a type of correlational research and you're going to get an understanding of how in correlational research we're only measuring variables and we're not um, manipulating them in any way at all. Next, we're going to talk about survey research, and again, we're going to have an entire unit dedicated to survey research, but this is just a brief introduction to survey research and how it relates to our correlational methods. So in survey research, what we're doing is we're gathering information via some sort of survey or questionnaire using a form of sampling techniques. So remember when we learned about sampling techniques before, where we talked about, you know, you can use uh, convenience samples, um, we can use uh, simple random samples or whether it's a probability sample or non-probability sample. That's what we're talking about here. Um, now, survey research is really great because it is quick, it is convenient, but it's open to a lot of biases. We have respondent biases where the individual themselves might have different responses based on um, how they perceive the survey or perceive the researcher or the research question in general. There's a lot of different types of biases that can occur. Additionally, we can have a lot of measurement bias. And in fact, when you're doing measurement, 
um, when you're doing survey research, a lot of 90% of what you're focusing on is how to reduce that measurement bias. And how can we, what's one way we can do it? Well, we can focus on that internal consistency component that I talked about before, in which case we're trying to increase our um, internal consistency in order to lower that measurement bias. So that what we're saying we're measuring is actually what we're measuring. If I have a scale for depression or anxiety, I want to make sure that that scale truly represents that construct or that conceptual variable of depression, right? I need to operationalize it correctly is what I'm doing with a survey. And a survey is essentially just a long list of all those measures, right? Or some sort of questionnaire, just a long list of all those measures, in which case we're in, interested in some sort of predictor variable predicting some sort of outcome variable. So I can look at someone's age and say, is that associated with their anxiety levels? Or is there in, or is their status in college associated with anxiety levels? Um, is their grades in high school associated with their grades in college? Those are a lot of things. So in the survey, I can ask those sorts of things. I can say, hey, what is your grade and what are your what is your status in college and what are your grades in college right now? And I'm able to ask those questions in a survey to kind of get at what is my research question of interest. Now, I want to note that even though we're going to have a whole unit on survey research later on in this course, you can also take an entire class on survey research and honestly still not feel fulfilled as to everything. We dig really deep into survey research in some of these classes. Um, you talk about measurement bias and, and, and ways to decrease it. We talk about things that just even the look of surveys. There's a lot of things that are associated with surveys that you can talk about that can't be covered in even a unit of this course. Um, but I'm going to try my best later on to really fulfill you um, in the understandings of survey research because really, chances are, um, even if you don't end up in psychology, you are either going to fill out a survey and it's cool for you to understand, or you're going to distribute some sort of survey and it's really good knowledge to understand what is truly going on with these surveys and how can we um, accurately assess our outcome variable of interest. So there's a few different types of survey methods. There's cross-sectional surveys, where we collect data at one time point from different groups. So for example, we just want to see the prevalence of a characteristic. So this could really be used in descriptive research as well, or see how variables relate to one another, um, which is correlational research. Um, so you can see how one variable relates to the other variable by just um, asking different questions on one survey. Additionally, we have repeated cross-sectional surveys. This is where you collect data from two or more time points with independent samples. So take this for example. I am interested in um, how a community might change over time. right? So I take a community survey and I distribute it to a random sample of people um, in the community and then collect the results and look at the outcome of, let's say, um, mental health literacy or something like that. Whereas then uh, later on and say two months later, I take the same survey and I distribute it out to the community again, uh, see what they know about mental health literacy. Now, keeping in mind that these are completely different individuals from within the community. So it's called pseudo longitudinal because I'm not actually taking it from the same people on both time points. That's where actual longitudinal surveys come in. That's when data is collected from the same people from two or more time points. Um, that we um, data is collected from the same people from two or more time points. So we can actually assess change over time um, from our longitudinal surveys from the same people. Now, something about longitudinal surveys is it's a little hard to keep um, participant retention, to keep people engaged in your surveys after time. I mean, you know, once you get an individual to participate in a survey once, it's hard to kind of get them back and try to get them so they take it each uh, take the survey again for you. So there's a lot of pros and cons to each of these. Um, Cross-sectional surveys are definitely the most convenient, easiest to run, um, and uh, they give you a nice snapshot of what you're looking at. Repeated cross-sectional surveys, again, kind of fulfill that convenience thing. You don't have to track down the same participants, whereas longitudinal surveys are truly the best, but the hardest to complete. Um, granted, there's a lot of longitudinal surveys out there that are really great.
So there's a lot of limitations of survey methods, and I talked about these a little bit already, right? So retention is one of the hardest things, especially in those longitudinal surveys. Um, uh, you know, you lose people, lose interest in the study, so they don't want to participate in the um, study. One way to help with that um, is through um, incentives, right? So you can you can have an incentive associated with that um, to try and get people to stay interested in your study and so forth. But there's a lot of um, the, you would learn this more in a survey research class, but there's a lot more that goes along with providing incentives and how that can create its own bias, even though you have more data. So it's a trade off as to well, do you want some sort of bias or do you want to um, have more people in your study. It's a really big trade-off and it's, it's, it's a really big subject to talk about and I might bring that up, I'm not sure, but I might bring that up in our unit on survey research. Um, next is one called self-presentation bias. Remember I highlighted bias because again we're always going to talk about bias. It's always a thing that we need to talk about where people want to present themselves consistently. Um, they and, and this goes actually in, in many different ways. So this is in longitudinal surveys where they want to present themselves consistently, even if there was a change um, in their attitudes or beliefs or some sort of outcome variable. Or additionally, we can even talk about self-presentation bias in terms of they want to appropriately answer your questions so that they, you either, this happens quite often where they want to answer questions in the way that they, they think the research question um, is worded or is phrased or is something. They want to actually help you with their study, um, which isn't ideal for researchers, but it happens quite more often than we'd like it to happen. And so there's a lot more with this, and we're going to dig more into this in our later units too, but we can talk about questionnaire design as well, um, which is open versus closed questioning. Now, an open coded question is something along the lines of saying, um, how are you doing today? Um, um, how did you enjoy the presentation, right? This is where someone has the ability to write anything they want or as long as they want um, a, as an answer to your question. Whereas a closed question um, allows them to, um, to it actually stops them from being able to write down everything they say. They say, you ask them on a scale of one to 10, which is that Likert scale that I was talking about, how much did you enjoy the presentation? So you confine them to what they're allowed to say. They're not allowed to express any opinions, but you get a really simple answer that's a lot easy for data analysis later. So open questions are great, but they're very complex and they're open to a lot of subjective and uh, subjective coding. They require a lot of coding, but it give a lot of information. Whereas closed questions, which is that Likert scale kind of that I was talking about, may oversimplify, but they're really great for data analysis. Like I, as a quantitative researcher, enjoy closed questions much more. Um, I do not like coding. I think it's very hard to do, but there's people out there that love it and all the power to them. I am not one of those people. I am the person that likes to get the number and just simply plug it in and do the statistics associated with it and see what we can see. But all the power to people who love doing the coding parts of the open questions. I personally work with closed questions more often, a lot easier to work with, um, and honestly kind of fun to work with as well. So some things to think about when you're doing survey question wording. To start, you have to say, do participants agree on the meaning of all the terms? So for example, uh, one really good example is on depression scales, they used to have, um, Oftentimes, um, they would say, how often do you feel blue? Now, a lot of people understand blue meaning sad, but there are certain populations that didn't understand what that meant. So they said, well, do I feel literally blue? So we had to start cutting that question out of depression surveys because um, these people didn't understand what the wording blue meant. But many Americans um, definitely understand what the what, certain, uh, what the word blue means when you talk about it in terms of feeling sad, but not everyone understood that, so we had to take it out. Um, you have to actually, and also, does the item make implicit assumptions about the participants? So is it saying um, when they read this, are they saying, uh, are they going to agree with it right away? Do they get it right away? Do they... Um, 
are you like for example his reading ability does it does it um does it have a higher reading ability than we would say? You oftentimes want to have a reading ability of around fifth grade reading level, even for adults, honestly. You want things to be very easy. Does you make the implicit assumption that they know larger words, right? Um, does each question measure the con concept of interest? Um, you should need to make sure this is where internal consistency and internal reliability come in, and where you're asking, you know, are we measuring the same thing with each of our questions? And additionally, will you be able to accurately interpret the data? This is where, you know, those open questions, um, open-ended questions are really hard to be sure that you're accurately interpreting the data because there's a lot of biases that can exist with open-ended questions. Whereas the closed-ended questions, you need to make sure that they are, uh, the scale that you choose is accurate, that the question you chose is accurately representing uh, the data, and will you be able to properly interpret that when you run the analysis? But there's a lot of benefits of survey methods. A lot of times they're more generalizable to the general population because you have access to more representative sample. You can give out a lot of surveys to people and get, it's a lot easier to do a simple random sample with surveys where you simply hand out these surveys to people as opposed to some experimental research where you need them to actually come in and do all these things. So oftentimes these survey methodologies can have some high external validity. Now I don't want to say that they're always going to have high external validity. If you use convenience sample, you use the convenience sample. But what I'm saying is that it's easier to distribute these surveys out to a large population of interest so that you can get a better, more representative sample. That's the beauty of surveys is that what I really like about them is that I'm able to do that with them. Now we're going to go ahead and take a step into archival research. Archival research is something that you probably are more aware of than you think, but you haven't really ever been exposed to. But really, all this is, is when you're analyzing data that other people have collected for you. So you um, can look into a data set. Um, someone collected all this data. You have no control over how the data was collected, but you have a data sheet full of numbers. That's archival research. Somebody already coded that data for you. Somebody already collected that data for you. And it's something in the past that's already been collected. What happens oftentimes is that um, researchers will collect more data than they need and will um, allow people to analyze the other aspects of that research. And it's good to have more data than you need. You can really never have too much data. Um, you know, it's a burden on your participants if you give out too many survey questions or do too long of an experiment of some sort. Um, but archival research is essentially just where you're analyzing other people's data. So there's a lot of different archival data sets out there already. Um, one of them is the MIDAS data set. That's the Midlife in the United States survey. Um, it's a national study of health and well-being where that's a longitudinal survey. So they are actually have gotten the same participants over time. I'm not sure how many um, survey times they've had, but this is exactly one um, where they do it. And it's, a, and it's publicly available, free for you to uh, go. It's a huge data set. There's also the um, Ad Health, which is the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Adult Health. Um, that is essentially the same thing as the MIDAS, but it's associated with adolescent health. And again, they get the same group of participants and they um, track them over time. Now, you might be saying, well, great, they did all the work for me. And that's exactly what it is. They did all the work for you and they have tons of variables that you can look at for correlational research. None of it is manipulated in any way. So it's all correlational research that you can look at. You can compare variables. If you wanted to right now, you can go download these data sets and start running your own analysis if you wanted to. Um, I'm not gonna say it's necessary. It's, well, actually it's, it's relatively easy if you needed help to download one of these data sets because you're interested in them, let me know and I can send you the link and we can get started on looking at things. Another one is the MTurk. Um, I believe this is like run by Amazon or, or something like that. I forget who it's run by, but essentially this is um, where employees get paid to kind of take surveys. Um, and a lot of people use this for their research, um, but it's essentially like a lot of like employee satisfaction and a lot of different things where you can, um, get data from um, 
individuals that were collected for you. And there's a lot of these data sets out there. Um, Google data set search is a great way of looking and finding them. If you type in Google, Google data set search into Google, you'll find that they have a search engine dedicated to finding these archival data sets so that you can, um, you know, do your own information, do your own searching, and do your own analysis on these. Um, these are publicly available so because they want people to do research on these. You can publish entire studies just on these research studies, on these Midas data sets um, and this ad health. I've seen a lot of research data sets out there. Um, a lot of times um, in grad school, we do um, research projects associated with these data sets that will eventually turn into publications for individuals. So it's really nice for that to happen. So thankfully, this was a little bit shorter. I hope you can enjoy your Thursday now that this was a shorter presentation for you all. Um, but um, overall, descriptive research is heavily utilized in many organizational settings, and it's important to know. I know we didn't really touch on it too much, but it's just essentially looking at one variable. And I think because we talked about correlational research so much, descriptive research kind of will come um, um, easier, but if you need any questions on descriptive research or you want more information, feel free to email me or we can have a Zoom chat about it and talk about it a little bit more. Um, correlational research measures variables and finds associations between them without any manipulation of variables. That's what we'll be talking about next week. Um, and then natural observation uh, survey research and archival research are three different types of correlational research and we're going to be talking a lot more about natural observation and survey research in a later unit. Um, but that's for later. Um, next week we'll be discussing um, experimental and quasi-experimental research and how to use that. So uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Have a great three-day weekend and goodbye.